As the nation slowly moved past the Civil War and began absorbing the enormous territories that made up the West, the opportunities for hard-working Americans to make their fortunes grew at a phenomenal rate. Unfortunately, the opportunities for the outlaws were growing just as quickly. Miners, gamblers, and ranchers could all be carrying enough cash to make themselves a target. Banks had little to no security. Stagecoaches and trains traversed vast stretches of lawless territory while carrying strong boxes full of cash. And passengers, who might have valuables of their own. After all, they were able to purchase a ticket. As outlaws refined their trade, so too did the lawmen. In the old American West, there were many kinds of lawmen. U.S. deputy marshals, town marshals, county sheriffs, Texas rangers, Pinkerton detectives, and shotgun messengers. If a man wore any badge at all, there was a good chance that he wore more than one in his lifetime if he managed to live long enough. Federal or state, town or county, public or private, these men all fought to enforce law and order upon an unruly and violent land. They were the lawmen of the West. The upheavals of the Civil War had aftershocks that lasted decades in the West as well as in the East. After the war, thousands of Americans rushed West to claim lands under the Homestead Act of 1862. This put settlers and Native American tribes at odds once again at a time when the federal government had already been at war with many of the tribes for years. Meanwhile, the tribes in the Indian Territory, which is today the state of Oklahoma, had not been in direct conflict with the US. When the Civil War began, the federal government withdrew its troops from the Western forts, leaving the tribes unprotected from their Confederate neighbors. Many felt that they had no choice but to ally themselves with the Confederacy. And when the war ended, the federal government declared them to have violated the terms of their previous treaty, and the new renegotiated treaty left the tribes with less land and a transcontinental railroad running straight through it. The end of the war also saw the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, and similar militant white supremacist groups that used terrorist tactics to intimidate, beat down, and kill 
former slaves, and the Republican agents of the Freedmen's Bureau who went south to enforce the changes of Reconstruction. But in the world of outlaws and lawmen, the Civil War played a major role in teaching a generation of future bandits how to rob, kill, mutilate, and terrorize their enemies. Fortunately, the war also imparted skills to those who would stand against the tide of chaos. Though Wyatt Earp is most famous for his time as a deputy U.S. Marshal in Tombstone, he actually spent much of his career as a law officer and as a shotgun messenger for Wells Fargo and Company. In a time before radios, patrol cars, and high-speed chases, express companies like Wells Fargo had to provide their own private law enforcement. With a gun across his knee, his treasure box under his feet, and his eyes peering into every patch of chaparral by the roadside, the shotgun messenger played a humble but important part in the economy of frontier life. Of course, the messenger had his gun and his six shooters, and he is paid to fight. The driver is paid to drive, and it takes him all his time to handle the lines without thinking of shooting. That is the cursedness of the shotgun's messenger's life, the loneliness of it. He is like a sheepdog, feared by the flock and hated by the wolves. On the stage, he is a necessary evil. Passengers and driver alike regard him with aversion. Without him and his pestilential box, their lives would be 90% safer and they know it. The bad men, the rustlers, the stage robbers, actual and potential, hate him. They hate him because he is the guardian of the property, because he stands between them and their desires, because they will have to kill him before they can get their hands on the coveted box. Most of all, they hate him because of his shotgun, the homely weapon that makes him the peer of many armed men in a quick turmoil of powder and lead. The Wells Fargo shotgun is not a scientific weapon. It is not a weapon to settle an affair of honor between gentlemen. But oh, in the hands of an honest man, hemmed in by skulking outlaws, it is a sweet and thrice blessed thing. In the severe code of ethics maintained on the frontier, such a weapon would be regarded as legitimate only in the service for which it was designed, or in defense of an innocent life encompassed by superior odds. These shotgun messengers were provided 10 or 12 gauge shotguns, typically 12 gauge for guard duty in town, and the more powerful 10 gauge for riding shotgun on a stagecoach. They were typically, though not always, short barreled. The spread and power of these guns made the shotgun messengers feared by many an outlaw. The barrels of the important civilizing agent under consideration are not more than two-thirds the length of an ordinary gun barrel. That makes it easy to carry and throw down upon the enemy with less danger of wasting good lead by reason of the muzzle catching in some vexatious obstruction. As the gun has to be used quickly or not at all, this shortness of barrel is no mean advantage. The weapon furthermore differs from the ordinary gun in being much heavier as to barrel, thus enabling it to carry a big charge of buckshot. No less than 21 buckshot are loaded into each barrel. That means a shower of 42 leaden messengers, each fit to take a man's life or break a bone if it should reach the right spot. And as the buckshot scatters liberally, the odds are in its favor. At close quarters, the charge will convert a man into a most unpleasant mess. As for range, well, at a hundred yards, I have killed a coyote with one of these guns. And what will kill a coyote will kill a stage robber any day. The express companies made a point of hiring men willing and able to fight, 
preferably those with a reputation for being dangerous men. They wanted potential robbers to think twice before challenging a coach with a man riding shotgun. Wyatt Earp and his brother Morgan both served as shotgun messengers, but neither actually had to fight off an attempted robbery. Both had been lawmen before, and their reputations were probably enough to encourage outlaws to wait until the next coach came by. For certainly, many coaches were robbed with passengers, drivers, and guards sometimes being killed. But one of the most famous stagecoach robbers actually made a point of never firing a shot. Better known as Black Bart, Charles Bowles was an unusual sort of outlaw. Frightened of horses, he would walk for miles out of Stockton, California, and into the mountains until he reached the spot he chose along the stagecoach trail. He put a flour sack over his head and then a derby cap on top of that. He was known to be courteous, and though he carried a shotgun, he never fired it during a robbery. He was also known for leaving poems behind after robbing a stage. His first poem read, I've labored long and hard for bread and honor and for riches, but on my corns too long you've tread, you fine-haired sons of bitches. Between 1875 and 1883, Black Bart robbed 27 Wells Fargo stagecoaches. He was caught after his last robbery in 1883. Former Wells Fargo agent James E. Rice described how he was captured thanks to the perseverance and detective work of a California sheriff and private detective. Sheriff Tom Cunningham of San Joaquin County was always at the scene of the robbery as soon as possible in an endeavor to locate evidence. Cunningham's staying qualities were finally rewarded after Black Bart's holdup of the stage from Sonora to Milton on November 3, 1883. Arriving at the point where the stage was robbed, the sheriff examined the ground very closely. Suddenly he reached down and picked up a handkerchief which incident marked the end of Bart's career. Cunningham examined the handkerchief very closely and directed his associate's attention to the laundry mark FX-07. The handkerchief was taken to San Francisco, and after a long search, similar marks were found on other linen in the laundry by Harry Morse, head of the Morse Patrol and Detective Agency of San Francisco. While Morse was in the office of the laundry investigating the marks on the handkerchief, he was told by the proprietor that the gentleman who owned that particular handkerchief was a respected customer, having mining interests in California, and he occasionally called at the laundry. By a rather remarkable coincidence, the owner of the linen walked into the building while Morse was there, and the detective immediately engaged him in a conversation. Morse told him he had some property he would like to submit for his consideration and that he would be glad to show him sample of ore as well as give him other details of the mining prospect. Bart apparently fell for what his newly made acquaintance had to offer and agreed to accompany him to the latter's office on Montgomery Street. When Bart entered and took in the surroundings, he was satisfied that he had been trapped for he threw up his hands and exclaimed, Gentlemen, I pass. That was the end of Black Bart's career in stage robbery, and it was brought about by the handkerchief which Sheriff Cunningham found. This sheriff served his county nearly 27 years and died in 1900 with a splendid record for bravery and uncompromising honesty. Sheriff Cunningham obviously played a major role in bringing about the capture of Black Bart but so too did private detective Morse. Private security and investigation services were critical in the Old West, providing manpower and expertise that were not always available to the local force. These included shotgun messengers 
and also private detectives, like the famous Pinkerton National Detective Agency, more commonly called simply the Pinkertons. Alan Pinkerton's agency had provided intelligence work for the Union during the Civil War, and afterward, it provided investigators who could go anywhere, not restricted by jurisdictional boundaries. His son, William A. Pinkerton, once explained another benefit the Pinkertons had. The robbers frequently have friends or relatives among the local authorities in the county in which they reside, and more particularly is this so in the South and Southwest. A Western officer once told me, when I asked his assistants to arrest a part of a train robbing gang, that he would deputize me and aid me secretly, but owing to the relatives and sympathizers of these men residing in the county, he dare not lend a hand openly. That I did not reside in the county and did not have to live there after this arrest was made, but he did. This man was a good officer and willing to do his duty, but it was impossible for him to conduct a fight against these men alone. Had it been known that he was against them, he would have been assassinated. For such reasons, the Pinkertons were hired to hunt down and capture the James Younger Gang, led by Frank and Jesse James and Cole Younger. The Pinkertons sent multiple undercover agents after the gang. Those agents were captured and murdered. Speaking in 1907, William Pinkerton said, The state of Missouri has probably produced more train robbers than any other state in the Union, and of whom the James brothers were the most desperate and vicious. When the war broke out, the brothers joined the Quantrill Band in their guerrilla warfare. After the war, the James boys, operating with Cole, Jim, John, and Bob Younger, Clell and John Miller, Charles Pitts, the Tompkins brothers, Jim Cummings, Dick Liddell, and other members of Quantrill's band began prowling through the west and southwest Missouri and eastern Kansas, looking for what spoils they could get, and for years committed a series of the most despicable crimes of that period in Missouri, Kentucky, and Minnesota, holding up banks in the daytime, robbing trains at night, murdering respectable citizens who resisted them, and killing officers who attempted their arrest. The Pinkertons were never successful in capturing the James Younger gang, but it began to fall apart in 1876. In September of that year, the gang attempted to rob the First National Bank of Northfield, Minnesota, far outside the Southern Territory, with which they were familiar. The Grange Advance Newspaper, September 13, 1886. A gang of eight mounted men made their appearance in Northfield, and while four of them went into the bank to rob it, the others kept up a fusillade on the streets to intimidate the citizens from interfering with the bank. The robbers endeavored to force the cashier, Mr. J. L. Haywood, to open the safe, but he would not do it, although they struck him with a pistol and swore that they would kill him if he did not comply. The delay caused by Mr. Haywood's bravery gave time for the citizens to recover from the first shock of surprise and alarm, and the accomplices outside warned the robbers in the bank to hurry out. Before leaving the bank, one of the robbers shot Mr. Haywood through the head, killing him instantly. The act was a cold-blooded and cowardly murder, for Mr. Haywood was utterly helpless at the time from the injuries he had previously received. Several citizens had by this time armed themselves and were firing upon the robbers. Two of them were hit, one dying on the spot, and the other soon afterwards. These were since identified by Mr. L. M. Hazen, a Cincinnati detective, as Charlie Pitts and Bill Chadwell. Finding the citizens thoroughly aroused, the robbers took the road towards Morristown, and shortly after, a company of citizens, well mounted, started in pursuit. From that time, the pursuit has been continued, other companies from various quarters joining in. Those who profess to know declare them to be the James and Younger Gang of Kansas and say that Jesse and Frank James and two of the Youngers are with this company. 
Some of this same gang were in the city not long ago and purchased horses and equipment here. They also visited the banks. One of them answers to the description of Jesse James, but they were not suspected at that time. The people of Northfield deserve great credit for the vigorous efforts they put forth to capture the corpses of these scoundrels. There are rewards of about $3,000 per head offered for the robbers, and they will no doubt be vigilantly followed, let them go where they may. But the truth is that their whereabouts is unknown. And while it is to be hoped that they may be caught by the parties still in pursuit, it is doubtful if they will be. But two weeks later, another local paper reported. Almost everyone had abandoned the idea of the capture of the murderous Missouri banditti. When the telegraph flashed the news that four of them had been captured, one being killed and three wounded. A teenager milking a cow with his father one evening saw a couple of strangers walk past. Although they were polite, the boy said he recognized them from their descriptions and told his father. But his father said they were not and told him to go and attend to his milking. The boy became so earnest that his father finally consented to let him go to Medelia and give the alarm. The boy rode at a breakneck pace to Medelia and Sheriff Glispin, with a small posse, started in pursuit between 9 and 10 o'clock. They overtook the robbers five miles from Medelia and opened fire on them at once. They crossed over a slough, walking slowly and deliberately, but the horsemen were unable to get over. A party went on to South Bend, to Doolittle's place, to head the robbers from going west or crossing the river, which they must have swam, the river being very deep. The pursuing party, now numbering about 50, surrounded the little patch of willows where the robbers were hid. Captain Murphy, B.M. Rice, George Bradford, Chaz Pomeroy, Sheriff Glispin, and John Voigt advanced into the coppice and scouted it thoroughly, advancing in skirmish line. Suddenly, the robbers opened fire at the advancing skirmish line, emptying their revolvers rapidly and the balls flying about as thick as hail. The advancing party has quickly responded to the fusillade, discharging several shots each and the men along the river joined in the rapid volleys. One of the skirmishers in the wood called out to the desperate bandits to hold up their hands and come in, or they would continue the fire. Almost at the recommencement of the firing, three men fell, and the fourth put up his hand and came out. He had fired several times after the others fell, getting another wounded man to load his pistols for him, for one of his hands were useless. The men in the woods then advanced and secured their prisoners, assisted them out of the woods and placing them in a lumber wagon, brought them into Medelia. The younger brothers had been captured and the other members of the gang were killed. Only Frank and Jesse James, who had split up with the rest of the gang after leaving Northfield, were able to escape. The brothers traveled with their families to Nashville, Tennessee, where they assumed new identities. They tried to go straight, and Frank, at least, seemed to adjust to a quieter life, despite the constant fear of being found out. But within a few years, Jesse returned to Missouri, formed a new gang, and returned to the life he knew so well. His new gang included the brothers, Charles and Robert Ford. Robert, 20 years old, had made a deal with Missouri Governor Thomas Crittenden to collect the bounty for the death or capture of Jesse James. The Ford brothers were living with Jesse, giving them a unique opportunity. Jesse was going in and out of the house, preparing for another robbery. It was a hot day, and Jesse removed his coat. Not wanting to arouse suspicions among his neighbors, he also removed his guns. At one point, Jesse noticed a dusty picture hanging on a wall. As he cleaned the picture, his back to the Fords, Robert Ford shot him in the back of the head. Five months later, Frank James surrendered to Governor Crittenden, preferring to stand trial rather than spend the rest of his life waiting for a friend to shoot him in the back. 
Frank was tried for two of the robberies and murders that he was believed to have committed. But in the wake of Jesse's death, Frank James was a sympathetic character. His defense team was able to establish reasonable doubt, and Frank was acquitted. Twenty years later, after Cole Younger was released from prison, he and Frank began a short-lived tour, the great Cole Younger and Frank James Historical Wild West Show. It lasted less than a year. The Younger brothers were not the only famed outlaws in their family. Their cousins, Bill, Gratt, Bob, and Emmett Dalton, formed the infamous Dalton Gang. The Daltons actually began as lawmen. Their oldest brother was a deputy U.S. Marshal under Judge Isaac Parker in the Oklahoma Territory. Isaac Parker had been a Missouri congressman and was nominated by President Ulysses Grant in 1875 to be the U.S. District Judge, presiding over the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Arkansas. Judge Parker would sit on that bench for 21 years, ruling on over 13,000 criminal cases. He sentenced 160 to death and was nicknamed the Hanging Judge. Judge Parker himself was actually opposed to the death penalty, but federal law required executions for those convicted of rape or murder. Judge Parker's jurisdiction included the Indian Territory, modern-day Oklahoma. In the territory, the Native American tribal courts had authority over Native American offenders, but no authority over non-Native offenders. Judge Parker appointed numerous lawmen to serve as his deputy marshals who could bring those offenders to justice. These included men like Frank Pistol Pete Eaton, who at age 15 outshot the best marksman at Fort Gibson, earning his nickname. He was made a deputy U.S. Marshal by Judge Parker when he was just 17, so that he could hunt down the men who had murdered his father. He remained in law enforcement for decades. Bass Reeves was the first African American to be made a deputy U.S. Marshal. Born a slave, in 1838, Bass Reeves escaped during the Civil War and went to live in the Indian Territory among the Creek and the Seminole. When Judge Parker was looking for deputies, Reeves' knowledge of the Indian Territory and ability to speak multiple Indian languages made him a perfect choice. A crack shot with a pistol or a rifle, he remained in law enforcement for the rest of his life. And another deputy U.S. Marshal under Judge Parker was Frank Dalton. Frank was killed by outlaws in 1887. And for a short time, his younger brothers, Gratt, Bob, and Emmett, followed in his footsteps, with both Gratt and Bob becoming deputy U.S. Marshals and Emmett occasionally serving on their posses. But when he was just 19, Bob Dalton killed a man. He claimed it was in the line of duty, but the dead man was known to be a rival with Bob for a woman. Within a few months, he was charged with smuggling liquor into the Indian Territory, and his brother Gratt was charged with stealing horses. They jumped bail and soon formed the Dalton Gang. They collected other outlaws and started robbing trains. Then, in October 1892, they attempted a daring robbery, intending to hit two banks at once in broad daylight in Coffeyville, Kansas. This episode, even more so than the James Younger Gang's disastrous robbery in Northfield, Minnesota, demonstrates yet another kind of lawman in the West, the vigilante. Common citizens of the town who took up arms to defend themselves and each other when outlaws struck. 
30 years earlier, a band of Confederate guerrillas led by William Quantrill tore through Lawrence, Kansas, pulling unarmed citizens from their homes and shooting them in the streets. The Dalton brothers were too young to fight in the Civil War like their cousins, the Youngers, who were part of Quantrill's raiders. But their outlaw tactics had their roots in those used by the murderous guerrilla bands that plagued Kansas during the war. But by 1892, those tactics were no longer a surprise. And in Coffeyville, 1892, the citizens who faced the Dalton brothers were neither unarmed nor helpless. After crossing the pavement, the men quickened their pace, and the three in the front file went into C.M. Condon and Company's bank at the southwest door, while the two in the rear ran directly across the street to the First National Bank and entered the front door of that institution. An observer was almost transfixed with horror. He had an uninterrupted view of the inside of Condon and Company's bank, and the first thing that greeted his vision was a Winchester in the hands of one of the men pointed towards the cashier's counter in the bank. He quickly recovered his lost wits and called out to the men in the store that the bank is being robbed. Persons at different points on the plaza heard the cry, and it was taken up and quickly passed around the square. At the same time, several gentlemen saw the two men enter the First National Bank. They gave the alarm on the east side of the plaza. A call to arms came simultaneously with the alarm, and in less time than it takes to relate the fact, a dozen men with Winchesters and revolvers in their hands were ready to resist the escape of the unwelcome visitors. At the Condon Bank, a teller fooled the gang into believing that there was a 10-minute time lock on the vault. The gang decided to wait it out. Just at this critical juncture, the citizens opened fire from the outside of the bank, and the shots from their Winchesters and shotguns pierced the plate glass windows and rattled around in the bank. The battle then began in earnest. Evidently recognizing that the fight was on, Grad Dalton asked whether there was a back door through which they could get to the street. He was told there was none. He then ordered Mr. Ball and Mr. Carpenter to carry the sack of money to the front door. Reaching the hall on the outside of the counter, the firing of the citizens through the windows became so terrific and the bullets whistled so close around their heads that the robbers and both bankers retreated to the back room again. Just then, one at the south door was heard to exclaim, I am shot. I can't use my arm. It's no use. I can't shoot anymore. At the First National Bank, things weren't going any better for the Daltons. Bob Dalton ordered the three bankers to walk out from behind the counter in front of him, and they put the whole party out at the front door. Before they reached the door, Emmett called to Bob to look out there at the left. Just as the bankers and their customers had reached the pavement, and as Bob and Emmett appeared at the door, two shots were fired at them from the doorway of the drugstore. Neither one of them was hit. They were driven back into the bank. Bob stepped to the door a second time and raising his Winchester to his shoulder took deliberate aim and fired in a southerly direction. Emmett held his Winchester under his arm while he tied a string around the mouth of the sack containing the money. They then ordered the young men to open the back door and let them out. Mr. Shepard complied and went with them to the rear of the building when they passed out into the alley. It was then that the bloody work of the dread desperados began. The moment that Grad Dalton and his companions, Dick Broadwell and Bill Power, left the Condon Bank, they came under the guns of the men in Isham's store. Grad Dalton and Bill Powers each received mortal wounds before they had retreated 20 steps. The dust was seen to fly from their clothes, and Powers, in his desperation, attempted to take refuge in the rear doorway of an adjoining store. But the door was locked, and no one answered his request to be let in. He kept his feet and clung to his Winchester until he reached his horse, when another ball struck him in the back and he fell dead at the feet of the animal that had carried him on his errand of robbery. Grat Dalton, getting under cover of the oil tank, managed to reach the side of the barn that stands on the south side of the alley. The marshal sprang into the alley with his face towards the point where the horses were hitched. This movement brought him with his back to the murderous Dalton, who was seen to raise his Winchester to his side and, without taking aim, fire a shot into the back of the brave officer. Marshal Connolly fell forward on his face within 20 feet of where his murderer stood. 
Dick Broadwell, in the meantime, had reached cover in the Long Bell Lumber Company's yards, where he laid down for a few moments. He was wounded in the back. A lull occurred in the firing after Grat Dalton and Bill Power had fallen. Broadwell took advantage of this and crawled out of his hiding place and mounted his horse and rode away. A ball from John Clower's rifle and a load of shot from the gun in the hands of Kerry Seaman overtook him before he had ridden 20 feet. Bleeding and dying, he clung to his horse and passed out of the city. His dead body was subsequently found alongside of the road a half mile west of the city. When Bob and Emmett Dalton reached the junction of the alleys, they discovered F.D. Benson in the act of climbing through a rear window with a gun in his hand. Divining his object, Bob fired at him point blank at a distance of not over 30 feet. The shot missed Mr. Benson, but struck a window and demolished the glass. Bob then stepped into the alley and glanced up towards the tops of the buildings, as if he suspected that the shots that were being fired at the time were coming from that direction. As he did so, the men at Isham's took deliberate aim at him from their position in the store and fired. The notorious leader of the Dalton gang evidently received a severe, if not fatal, wound at this moment. He staggered across the alley and sat down on a pile of dressed curbstones near the city jail. True to his desperate nature, he kept his rifle in action and fired several shots from where he was seated. His aim was unsteady and the bullets went wild. He arose to his feet and sought refuge alongside of an old barn west of the city jail and leaning against the southwest corner, brought his rifle into action again and fired two shots in the direction of his pursuers. A ball from Mr. Clower's rifle struck the bandit full in the breast and he fell upon his back among the stones that covered the ground where he was standing. After shooting Marshal Conley, Grat Dalton made another attempt to reach his horse. Turning his face to his pursuers, he again attempted to use his Winchester. John Clower's rifle spoke in unmistakable tones another time, and the oldest member of the band dropped with a bullet in his throat and a broken neck. Emmett Dalton had managed to escape unheard up to this time. He kept under shelter after he reached the alley until he attempted to mount his horse. A half dozen rifles sent their contents in the direction of his person as he undertook to get into the saddle. Emmett succeeded in getting into the saddle, but not until he had received a shot through the right arm and one through the left hip and groin. During all this time, he had clung to the sack containing the money they had taken from the First National Bank. Instead of riding off, as he might have done, Emmett boldly rode back to where Bob Dalton was lying and reaching down his hand, attempted to lift his dying brother on the horse with him. Just then, Kerry Seaman fired the contents of both barrels of his shotgun into Emmett's back. He dropped from his horse, carrying the sack containing over $20,000 with him, and both fell near the feet of Bob, who expired a moment thereafter. The Daltons had begun their careers as lawmen, but died as outlaws under vigilante fire. The Daltons' switch from lawmen to outlaw was not as unusual an occurrence as you might think. The politics of the day were still affected by old Civil War allegiances. In the former Confederate states and some of the border states, there were many acts of violence taken to further political causes. Often, these were undertaken by former Confederate soldiers or their younger brothers and sons as members of the Ku Klux Klan or similar paramilitary groups attacking Republican officials and African Americans who tried to take advantage of their new freedoms. But in the Lincoln County War in New Mexico, the politics wasn't about party, it was about money. On one side were the merchants and businessmen, led by Lawrence Murphy, who owned an enormous mercantile store in Lincoln County called The House. Along with James Dolan, he virtually ran Lincoln County, including its sheriff, William Brady. On the other side was an Englishman named John Tunstall, who partnered with attorney Alexander McSween and rancher John Chisholm to develop a cattle ranch, store, and bank. The two sides struggled, in particular, over the federal contract selling beef to forts and the Indian agencies. Murphy and Dolan 
rumored to get much of their beef from rustlers, had a lock on the government contract. They had a sweet deal, and they resisted attempts to encroach on it violently. Sheriff Brady rounded up a posse, which included members of multiple outlaw gangs, to seize Tunstall's assets. When Tunstall argued, the posse killed him in cold blood. In response, Tunstall's cowhands formed a group called the Regulators to bring his killers to justice. They were deputized by the local Justice of the Peace and set off after the members of the sheriff's posse with legally issued warrants. Both sides claimed to be representing the law, and both sides were willing to be judge, jury, and executioner. When the regulators captured two of the men who killed Tunstall, their leader promised the men would be taken alive to Lincoln County to stand trial. But at least one member of the regulators wasn't willing to trust Lincoln County justice, and he killed both prisoners, and even one of his fellow regulators, whom he believed was helping them. Their killer was a young man called by many names and aliases over his lifetime, but he was most famously called Billy the Kid. Born William Henry McCarthy, Jr. in 1859, the man who would call himself William Bonney and would be called Billy the Kid by everyone else was one of the most celebrated outlaws of the West. By the time he was 16, he was living as a fugitive in Arizona Territory, though for relatively minor offenses. But while there, he killed a man, perhaps in self-defense, though the coroner's inquest ruled the shooting unjustifiable. He fled to the New Mexico Territory, where he took up cattle rustling, and he called himself William H. Bonney. In 1877, he was hired as a cattle guard by John Tunstall. Tunstall seemed to have taken a liking to young Billy, a fact that likely enraged Billy all the more when Tunstall was murdered by Sheriff Brady's posse. Territorial Governor Samuel Axtell decided that the Lincoln County Justice of the Peace, who had deputized the regulators, had been improperly appointed by the county commissioners. Suddenly, the regulators were not deputies, but an outlaw gang themselves. In response, Billy and other members of the regulators ambushed the sheriff Brady and his deputy, killing them in the street. The continuing, rising violence on both sides eventually convinced much of the public that the regulators were as bloodthirsty as Murphy and Dolan's gangs. And when the Lincoln County War finally ended, the new governor, Lou Wallace, offered amnesty for everyone involved who was not already under indictment. Billy, however, was under indictment, but he contacted the governor and worked out a promise to grant amnesty for Billy in exchange for his testimony. However, the local district attorney didn't feel bound by the governor's promise and refused to free Billy after he testified. Billy escaped and spent the next year and a half as a fugitive. Then, in December 1880, he began to be hunted by the new sheriff of Lincoln County, Pat Garrett. And what finally brought about the end of the Wild West that provided lawmen as formidable as Wyatt Earp, as flashy as Wild Bill Hickok, and as duplicitous as the Daltons? All this and more as we take a final look at the lawmen of the West. <laughs> 